Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, so this is a joint a talk joined with uh, Mario Berta, with Fernando Brandao, Gilad Gur, Ludovico Lamy, who just talked, uh, Martin Plenio and uh, Marco Toma Michel. And um, yes, this is a bit unusual, an unusual talk for QIP because it also serves as, as an erratum to some previous QIP talks. Uh, but that's not the main point of the talk. I want to stress this. Uh, the main point I would like to tell you about is the connection between two different areas, two different problems in quantum information. One is the reversibility of quantum resources, in particular of quantum entanglement, and one is quantum hypothesis testing. So uh, the talk will be about the very deep and quite surprising connection between these two areas. Uh, but of course, before I can talk about this part, I would like to introduce the two um, areas themselves. So, uh, to understand reversibility of quantum entanglement, uh, we have to rewind back to the mid-1990s when the protocol of entanglement distillation was first studied. So, distillation is about taking, sorry, taking many uh, copies of a pure sta quantum state and then converting them into fewer copies of a maximally entangled, um, of maximally entangled singlets. So the quantity we're interested in here is the distillable entanglement, so the maximal rate at which this is possible. And what I mean by a rate is we are taking essentially n copies of the given input state and transforming them into r times n copies of the target uh, maximally entangled state. This can be done up to some error epsilon, uh, and as long as this error uh, epsilon vanishes in the limit as n goes to infinity, we are happy and this is an achievable, achievable rate. Uh, now, this is a bipartite setting, so we have two separate party, parties, Alice and Bob, and so we constrain them. That Alice and Bob can only perform local operations and, and classical communication. This is the basic setting of um, entanglement theory. And uh, now, uh, I will also use the, this notation R from uh, Psi to uh, the maximal entanglement state to denote the, this uh, such a rate of conversion. Now, uh, this was shown... Um, it was shown that for any pure quantum state, this rate of the stillable entanglement equals the entropy of entanglement, so the entropy of the reduced uh, subsystem of the given state. Uh, but why is this interesting? Why is this important? It's, uh, well, one reason why this is important is because of the, the reverse conversion task. So, uh, remember that uh, distillation is about converting from a given state psi to the maximally entangled singlet. But if we ask about the opposite transformation, so from a singlet to the given uh, state, so how much, how expensive is it to create a given state using um, maximally entangled singlets, this is known as the entanglement uh, cost. And the remarkable result about pure state entanglement is that uh, these two quantities are equal. So the stillable entanglement equals the entanglement cost and is given by the entropy of entanglement. What this means is that uh, every pure state can be reversibly converted into the singlet. So we can go uh, like this from psi to the singlet and, and back and the overall rate is just equal to one. So asymptotically we are not really losing anything here. This can be generalized to arbitrary states. So from any psi to any phi, we go at the rate which is given by the ratio of the entropies of entanglement. And this establishes what, what, what can be thought of as a second law of entanglement because this identifies the entropy of entanglement as the unique quantity that essentially tells us everything there is to know about converting quantum states asymptotically. So as, as long as you know this one quantity, well, these two states, you know if they can be converted and how well they can be converted into each other. So obviously this kind of parallel, um, especially the parallel with thermodynamics, because in, in thermodynamics we also have the entropy as the similar kind of quantity that governs convertibility of, of, of states of a physical system without adding more heat to the system. So that's like a nice kind of parallel between uh, um, entanglement and thermodynamics. So this of course motivated the question of how general is the property and can we establish a general um, kind of law of this type? And uh, unfortunately, not, not, not really, because the case of mixed states is, is more complicated. So mixed states were found to be irreversible under LCC. So we know that uh, there are states for which we can always dis we can distill less than, than uh, the in entanglement cost. Um, but this did not make people lose hope. So people still try to um, find some kind of reversible theory of entanglement. And how can this be done? Well, this um, essentially the first step is to realize that maybe we are suffering because we are re restricting ourselves to LOCC. That is the standard setting, but what happens if we allow Alice and Bob to use some additional resources? For example, if we give them access to a positive partial transpose or PPT states, then they can implement so-called PPT operations, and um, this gives us more operational power. In particular, there are states, for example, the antisymmetric states, for which we know they are irreversible, so the distillable entanglement with LOCC is less than the cost, but under PPT operations, they become reversible. 
So this suggests that maybe giving access to some more resources will allow us to have this fully reversible theory of entanglement. So this indeed motivated the question of how to obtain a reversible theory of entanglement. So this can be understood as essentially the reversibility of the rates or that we want for every state that is double entanglement to equal the entanglement cost under some other kind of operations. And this was identified by Martin Plenny as one of the most um, important open problems in quantum information theory in 2005. And this led to a, a number of um, follow-up results, uh, the most significant of which uh, was probably uh, as, um, a series of papers by um, Fernando Brandao and Martin Plenio. So I would like to talk about that now. That um, approach uses so-called asymptotically non-entangling non operations. So instead of um, LOCC, we will define a set of operations defined in a kind of like an axiomatic way. So remember that we are transforming um, many copies of a quantum state. So we start with the n-copy um, row. And um, one way to define a kind of axiomatic free operations is to um, define so-called non-entangling operations, which means that for every separable state, the output is separable. It's a very easy definition, but what Fernando and Martin did, they relaxed this definition a bit. So they said that, okay, for every separable state, we can generate, um, let's say, small uh, amount of entanglement according to some measure. So they fixed a measure of entanglement. This is known as the global robustness of entanglement. And they said that uh, for every step separable state, we get at most delta n of this quantity at every step of the protocol n. And as long as the delta n goes to zero, we are happy. That's how they define the operations. And then they studied the uh, conversions of states under these operations. And what did they find? Well, they found that the cost under these operations equals, well, like a regularization of this global robustness of entanglement quantity. This is a bit ugly, but the crucial thing is that this, is this, this quantity, actually, it equals the regularized relative entropy of entanglement. And what is this? This is essentially a generalization of the entropy of entanglement from pure state to, to mixed states, at least one of such generalizations. And this suggests that we are on the right track to finding a, a nice extension of the pure state results to the mixed state case. But to complete this um, theory, you would have to find a um, distillable entanglement which matches this entanglement cost. So what did um, Fernando and Martin find is that the distillable entanglement under these operations equals the asymptotic error exponent in um, quantum hypothesis testing between a given state row and all separable states. And that is quite a mouthful. So I would like to take a step back and try to understand what um, hypothesis testing actually is. And the basic framework of uh, hypothesis testing you might have seen in a few talks already, but the point is we are given one of two quantum states. We don't know which one. We have to perform a measurement and uh, try to guess which of them we obtained. We can make two types of errors here. One is we incorrectly guess sigma, and one is we incorrectly guess rho. Uh, then we study the minimal um, error uh, of type 2, uh, constraints such that the error of type 1 is at most epsilon. Now, this is a very simple optimization problem. It's going to be solved exactly, but um, the point that we want to understand is what happens when we have more copies of these states. So we have uh, essentially uh, n copies of rho or sigma. And then it's not, easy to, it's not difficult to see that this would, error will decay exponentially to zero. Uh, but the crucial, crucial question is how fast does it actually decay? So this exponent is known exactly as this hypothesis testing relative entropy. And uh, one of the most fundamental results in quantum information is the quantum Stein's lemma, which tells us that this exponent um, in the limit as n goes to infinity equals exactly the quantum relative entropy. And I want to stress, this is the first operational meaning of the quantum relative entropy. Before this result, it was not known if the quantity has any operational meaning. And this is, uh, it's this result that gives, us the, gives it the meaning of being a proper measure of, of distinguishability of quantum states. Um, so, yes, yeah, so... Uh, the issue here is that often we don't actually know if we, what state we get as the second state in this in this case. We we for example we might only know that we get some separable state, but we don't know which separable state. So we have to essentially distinguish rho from all separable states. So then the error will be essentially the maximal error of all separable states, and the exponent defined similarly. And then we are asking what happens when we have n copies of rho, and we are distinguishing that from some arbitrary separable state. Uh, so the conjectured um, generalization of the quantum Stein's lemma uh, was that, um, indeed, this quantity um, is given exactly by the regularized relative entropy of entanglement. That was the, essentially the extension of this fundamental result to this composite um, hypothesis testing setting. Um, and I want to stress why is this so important? Well, because this would, if this were true, uh, this would complete this theory of entanglement. So this would uh, give us that distillable entanglement exactly equals entanglement cost, and we have a reversible theory of entanglement. 
however, even I mean, despite the fact that these three first results are fine, um, the last one is not. The last one, there is a gap in the proof, uh, and that's why we don't really have that result anymore, and we cannot rely on it. So essentially, we don't know if this, this is true anymore. And before I discuss the, the problem here with the proof, I would like to talk about the consequences, because that is probably the more interesting part to many of you. Uh, the consequence, well, the main consequence is about the reversibility of entanglement. We, we have lost the first and the only actually claim so far, reversible framework for entanglement manipulation. So this undermines the results of Brandao and Peño in their uh, series of papers. Uh, and also, it, this was presented as the plenary talk at QIP 2008. So if you remember that, please forget that. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this actually holds beyond entanglement theory. So this holds actually uh, in other quantum resources. And uh, indeed, these kind of generalized Stein lemma or irreversibility results, they were the first results that connected different quantum resource theories together in like, a very nice unified framework. So we, we, we lost that also. Uh, I want to stress that there are some resources which are, resources which are known to be reversible, for example, well, thermodynamics or quantum coherence, which just don't have this general result anymore that uh, works also for entanglement theory. And indeed, uh, some recent results might suggest that actually, maybe entanglement is not even reversible uh, at all. Because um, if you were at QIP last year, you might have heard Ludovico's talk, where he talked about um, the difficulty in reversibly manipulating entanglement, and essentially that entanglement uh, is, is much more difficult to reversibly convert than other quantum resources. And in particular, essentially, for every set of quantum, st uh, of quantum operations smaller than what Brandao Plenio used, we've, showed, uh, we've shown that uh, entanglement is irreversible. So essentially, if you want to have a reversible theory of entanglement, you have to use these operations that Bernard Planer defined, or something even larger. But essentially, we don't know anymore if, if that reversibility is even true. Um, okay, of course, we also lost the results in composite hypothesis testing. So we don't have any more than um, asymptotic error exponent in distinguishing a quantum state from, all, uh, from a general set of quantum states. And there are some other results that work in certain um, limited settings or under additional assumptions, but we don't have the tools to recover the original statement of, of Brandao and Plenio. And um, there are some other results that use the results or methods of, of, of these papers. For example, there was an attempt to show a strong converse result in distinguishing quantum channels that it, well, doesn't work anymore because it relied on this result. There is another plenary QIP talk from 2011 that talked about the faithfulness of squashed entanglement. And uh, that proof uses also the general Stein's lemma. It, it can be avoided, so it's not a huge deal here, but I just wanted to, to point out that essentially that also relied on the original result um, there. Okay, so uh, I'm sure you're curious what actually is the problem with the result of um, operando plenio. Well, pro the problem is in this lemma, one of the many lemmas, and this is completely incomprehensible. So I'd like to focus on the actual statement that they, they make there. The, they study a function of this form. This is like a var entropy like function, if you're familiar with the var entropy. And what they claim is that if this probability distribution, this is a probability distribution P, if this is bounded below by some value, essentially for sufficiently large n, we can always, um, for every probability distribution, we can essentially say that this is less than one. So we can, this var entropy is less than n, essentially. Uh, but this this claim is not true, and actually it's very simple to find a counterexample because it suffices to find one distribution which has a var entropy larger than one, of which there are many, and just take the IID copy, like n copy of this distribution, and then it has a var entropy larger than n. So just this this claim is just not correct. So why did they arrive at this incorrect claim? Well, because they they argued about the maximization of a function like this. This is a, a simple calculation from from the paper. This is a, um, from the paper. And, uh, well, how do you maximize a function? Well, you can use Lagrange multipliers. Um, yes, so um, they did that, and they forgot one of them. Uh, so the 30-page proof is not valid because of one missing Lagrange multiplier. Uh, so that is the story here, uh, essentially. Um, yes, okay, so we cannot, we don't know how to recover the original statement of Brandao Plenio of our reversibility, but what can we recover? This is what we studied in our uh, paper. Okay, so uh, let's try to think of the setting of, of Brandao Plenio, the original one. We have many copies of Rho and a big separable state. So there's Alice and Bob, and they have this large state. Um, state. But again, this is an n-copy situation. So we have n copies of Rho, so this system also is an n-copy system. So we have essentially n Alice's and n Bob's. Um, but the issue is, we impose separability between Alice and Bob, but these Alice's, these different Alice's, then can be entangled among themselves, essentially. Um, what happens if we impose then that Alice's are also separable? 
So we, we change the setting a bit. I want to stress this is a different setting, we call this pseudo-entanglement. And in this setting, we actually can show reversibility. So we can actually recover all the, the results of Brandao Peña in this particular setting. So changing the, the kind of the, the assumptions, we recover the, uh, the Stein's lemma and this reversibility theory. But this is not fully satisfy satisfying, right? Because we don't actually get the original results. So how do we get from here to the original setting. Well, we could try to group Alice and Bob. So we, now we, what we, what happens if we assume that we, we have entanglement, we allow entanglement between, say, we, we allow entanglement between K Alice's, but not more. So we group them into blocks of K, K uh, Alice and K Bob's, and we say that they can be entangled, but um, yeah, but not more than K. So then if we take the limit as K goes to infinity, this seems like we are getting back to the original setting. Uh, okay, so what we can show is that if we do the usual discrimination strategy using the hypothesis that testing relative entropy, and then we take the limit as k goes to infinity, then we actually get the relative, uh, the regularized relative entropy of entanglement back. So this is what Brandal Peña were claiming essentially as the, the, the rate of, of distillation. So we recover a very similar result, but it's almost there, but it's not quite. It's not quite what Brandal Peña had because what they had was these limits interchanged. And we don't know if we can interchange these limits. If we, one could show this, then the, the, we are done, we are recovered the original result. Okay? But we don't know if this can be done. Um, there are some other similar, uh, very similar uh, conceptually uh, ways to, uh, to recover the result. For example, one is the strong converse of Dmax. This is a bit technical, but I hope the people who don't Dmax will care about this. Uh, so it's now that Dmax, if you minimize the separable state, it goes to the regular relative entropy of entanglement in the limit of epsilon going to zero. And also it is known that the uh, dh is approximately equal to d max, but here the error changes. The error from, goes from being small to being large. So essentially, if we could understand what happens to d max in the limit as uh, the error goes to 1, so the strong converse regime, if this could also be shown to go to the relative entropy, then again we are done and we've uh, recovered the original result. Another approach is the pets rainy divergences. Uh, it is known that this dh is upper lower bounded by um, a function of the pets rainy divergences. And um, so if we take the limit, we, we have this kind of uh, relation that we will have a lower bound. But again, if we could interchange these limits, so if we, if we could put the alpha on the inside of this um, equation, then this is just the regularized rate of entropy again. So uh, this would again recover the, the original Stein's lemma. Uh, but, yeah, we don't know if any of these are true. Okay, um, so that is um, it. I would like to kind of quickly go through what I showed you, because I wanted to emphasize that there is a very deep connection between uh, quantum hypothesis testing and reversibility of quantum resources. Uh, that unfortunately there is a gap in the proof that um, undermines some of the most important results, um, connecting these two fields and showing some very strong relations. Um, and um, essentially, we can recover some variants of these results. We can change uh, assumptions a bit and get some results, but we cannot recover the original ones. So the question remains open. Can we reversibly uh, manipulate entanglement? That is just the most general way to phrase the question. And uh, a nice kind of like this basic way that I uh, talked about mostly to phrase the question is essentially, is the distillable entanglement under these operations, these asymptotically non-entangling operations, is it equal to the cost? And this is fully equivalent to this generalized Stein's lemma. So uh, does the error exponent in distinguishing uh, any state from a separable state, does it equal the irregular relative entropy of entanglement? Uh, this is the, the big open question. And um, Martin Plenio's group in Ulm kindly offered a uh, this beautiful stone to anyone who solves uh, this problem. And... Uh, I want to clarify, uh, stone in German is Stein, so that's kind of the, just to clarify the, 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 the meaning of this offer. Um, yes, uh, so I hope this uh, appeals to everyone. And okay, so just to conclude, the most important message of this talk is check your Lagrange multipliers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for questions. Thank you for the nice talk. So I, I believe that uh, the gap of the proof can be cleared even in the original statement, but uh, as a first step, a kind of first step, uh, by imposing a little additional assumption on the statement, on the original statement, can we clear the 
that the gap of the group, proof? Do you have some idea? Kind of? Well, uh, one thing we do is this setting. So if we kind of impose this kind of separability additionally on this kind of the, uh, the, the, the many analysis, this is the one way we know to recover. We don't know how to recover it in different settings. We don't really have um, Stein lemmas in, other, in this kind of context. There are other works that study, that study Stein's lemmas in different assumptions, but not really exactly what we are looking for here. So we have very specific, for example, for um, other research theories, other quantum resources. We can solve the Stein's lemma kind of in using different approaches, but we don't know how to get anything for entanglement um, except when we do this kind of the block-based approach here. Uh, that's, I think, the only answer we can give, unfortunately. We don't really have a good method to, to, to get there. I guess others are wondering as well what uh, led to the discovery of the uh, flaw in the proof. Oh, uh, okay. So there was uh, this paper, this particular paper, where they um, were studying a strong converse um, discrimination of quantum channels, and they essentially they they, they use the same methods as as Brandel Plenier did. Uh, except that they kind of wrote, paper, wrote the proofs in a slightly different way, and then that led to uh, Marco, one of our co-authors, to essentially discover a, an error in that, in that paper. Uh, and then it was essentially a kind of a realization that the methods were just the same as the Brandau Plenty one. So if there's a mistake in this one, there must be a mistake in the previous one also. So that was uh, that was it essentially. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's thanks to this work pretty much that uh, the error was uncovered because the way that the proof is written in the original one is because it's uh, just not really understandable for anyone. So that's why. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you mostly talk about entanglement. Um, but so what are these other, what's your sense of what these other, say, classes of convex states where I would have a generalized Stein's lemma for? Uh, yeah, we have, the, for example, the theory of quantum coherence, which is essentially um, a theory where the free states, or the, the uh, like, instead of separable states, you have only di diagonal states in some basis. And then we can show that uh, there is a Stein's lemma. Uh, but I think this is the most complicated, even though it's not complicated at all, but that's the most complicated set for which we have a, a, a Stein's lemma, and uh, in this particular setting. Because again, Stein's lemmas can be discovered, can be uh, recovered for like, if we change the, the setting, and, and they have been studied in, in many different in works, and, and they have composite results also. It's just that the composite kind of, the way you define the set of, of the composite kind of hypothesis is different. And if you want this kind of operational approach that we are using here, uh, then we don't really have results, I believe, beyond um, these two theories, I think, thermodynamics and uh, quantum coherence. Um, yeah, that's, I think, the only ones I know of for which we have a Stein's lemma. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. So, uh, so as you were saying, uh, that what we, so what we are trying, trying to prove is using these asymptotically uh, non-entangling operations, right? So what yes. if so these are like if I'm correct these are some joint operations on both Alice and Bob. Yes. Yeah. So so what if we take like let's say some other joint oper operation and maybe in that case we will get, have this rever reversibility. Yeah. So the issue is if you take if you make your op operations too large then you're essentially making the whole thing trivial because you can generate as much entanglement as you as you want and then it just doesn't make any sense essentially. You want them to be somehow constrained so you you, you cannot generate too much entanglement or you cannot essentially create entanglement from nothing uh, but you also want it to be reversible and that's what we don't have so we can either trivialize the whole thing or we can have irreversibility we don't have any example of a reversible class of operations yet so yeah that's the where the problem is hi thank you for the talk very nice so if you if your goal is just to show that entanglement you cannot do this well go and then return this reversibility. The existence of bound entanglement shows the existence directly, right? Under LOCC. Under LOCC, yes. Under these operations, there is no, there is no bound entanglement under these operations. Ah, yes. That was going to be my question. Mm. Your operation, you don't have bound entanglement. No, actually, in our uh, paper, actually, we explicitly show that you don't have to use the result by, by Bernard Plenio. We can actually uh, have a non-zero lower bound on the syllable entanglement. So there is no bound entanglement in this setting. So you cannot have this dramatic difference like between... Uh, yeah, it's not as dramatic. It's just, yeah. But still, there is a difference, yes. So it was fascinating to me to see that actually a lot of this hinges on this order of limits that you showed yes. in your slide. Is there is there some intuition about what would like what this actually corresponds to? Is there like some does that give you an idea of where to look for a counterexample, for instance? No. 
<laughs> I, that's all I can say. I don't. Uh, I don't think. Uh, no, we've tried the usual kind of um, usual suspects for counterexamples, and they are not counterexamples here. So, like, we don't have any idea uh, for what we could be looking for. Essentially, even uh, that doesn't really give any intuition. So, uh, no, we're lost. But we are uh, looking into it. So, I hope we'll manage to find something eventually. But uh, for now, no ideas. You'd have time for one more question. <laughs> Uh, thanks. This is maybe not a very scientific question, but I think it's an obvious question from this talk, which is, do you think this result is true and unproven, or, uh, or do you believe it might be false? Um, so I can just say that we, among the authors of this paper, we have disagreements about this, and uh, there is money on the line also. Uh, but uh, we don't have, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, me personally, I think it's true. <laughs>